Acts in the New Testament, chapter 1, 9, verses 1 through 22. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, which is what the Christians were called, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against goats. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the man who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul rose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But he led them by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there were a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said to him, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he had seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent his days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on his, this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. nothing. 
But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? And they answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord! Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in a little boat, for they were not far from land about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw fire and coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153 and although there were so many, the net was not broken. And Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who were you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Then Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Feed my lambs. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourselves and walked where you wished. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. When he had spoken this, he said to them, Follow me. The Gospel of the Lord.
everything was going good, um, and then all of a sudden, we needed to stop. And I'll let you fill in the blanks of why. <laughs> and after stopping three different places, we finally found an open and got in. But unfortunately, looking at the clock, we were going to be late. And <laughs> what ran through my mind was, you know, maybe this isn't such a good idea. Maybe we do need to find a place closer to us in Williamsburg. But I love you guys, and I love our pastor, and I love everything about this place. And that just, the thought came and it went. And, <laughs> and then when you looked at me and said, you have a testimony, it's like, okay, now I know why we were put so many obstacles for us to get here. Because you were going to ask me to do this. <laughs> I give you lots of notice. I, I know I'm not. <laughs> so, as Pastor said, uh, my testimony is about healing. And for many years, we had a healing ministry here and on Wednesday evenings, and I was a part of that. And it's, uh, it, it changed my life in many, many ways. But the healing that I received that Sunday was moving into a new house, unpacking boxes, all this other stuff. I could barely move with the pain in my, in my back. And every time I did, it felt like there was a dagger. And when you said, a knot in your back, I touched it, I received it, and I haven't had it since. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All I, all I want to share with you is God has healed me in a number of ways, and, and it's been physical ways. And when pastor gets a word and, and wants to share that with you, and please don't be embarrassed. Please do not say, I can't claim that because it's probably not. It is for you, and please take it because he's, he's ready. He wants to do it for us. All we got to do is stop being stiff-necked and take it. It's that gift that he just wants to keep doing. So. You know, I have never healed one person. Jesus heals people. I couldn't even cure a hand. <laughs> he does the entire thing, right? <laughs> we have children's uh, church, and Miss Arden uh, is going to lead the way. Let's just pray over them and over the word of Jesus. Thank you so much. What a joy that you're raising up generations of worshipers, generations of evangelists generations of world changers in our midst, generations of mighty ones proclaiming your word. You're going to be in every single area of influence, medicine, business, every single area of influence, government, military. I bless them. I bless the word that they're going to receive. I also bless the word this morning that you have for us. And our hearts will be open, our minds will be open to receive all that you have for us. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Boy, a good looking church. And you smell good too. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait. We're going to have Holy Communion this morning. And I just treasure those times. But first, I want to have a little bit of time to talk with you. Maybe we could talk about John chapter 21. And if you have your word, however you have that, whether it's in book form or it's an e-book or it's on your, uh, or maybe your tablet or maybe it's on your smartphone. And maybe you're working Facebook. That's all right. We have folks on Facebook Live. Uh, maybe you're texting folks, if you could put in a good word for us. 
And I, I just am trusting God has something for us. Rehabbing Peter. We're going to talk about rehabbing Peter. Uh, you know, there, there's an, an old story about George H.W. Bush that when he was president, they happened to take him to uh, one of the area nursing homes so he could, he could walk around and he could greet everybody. And apparently when he was there, he walked up to one of the residents who was sitting in a wheelchair and he just looked at the gal and he shook her hand and he said, do you know who I am? And she looked at him and said, well, I don't, but if you ask at the nurse's station, they can tell you. <laughs> you just never know. I've had a chance. Uh, in being in ministry and uh, from my days as being a, a full-time paramedic uh, and even my first job was in a nursing home and I was in the back and uh, I, I was working uh, in the, the kitchen, the dietary and uh, boy you'd see some interesting things come when, when they were going to, you know, I was in charge of washing the dishes and everything. And uh, we get some interesting things on some of those trays. Sometimes we find false teeth, hearing aids. You have to be really careful. You're like looking around going, you know, what happened this? And I remember, because I used to stand there and I'd chat with the person who was next to me to the point where I had get written up. We're talking too much while we were doing dishes, but I just had stuff to chat about, you know. And um, so I get written up for talking too much. Now I get written up if I don't talk enough. Can you believe that? What I do now? But I've had a chance to see over the past, I want to say, about three years of ministry, I've seen a lot of changes in nursing homes where they've gone from being those places that that just uh, warehouse older people to the place where they really are taking an active step in providing rehabilitative care to people who are in need. And it used to be the idea that when you went to a, a nursing home and rehab, that was kind of like God's waiting room, all right? I know I'm not supposed to tell jokes like that. Yeah. I know you want to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the last, you know? But now what we see, what we've seen over the years is that a nursing home and rehab has really moved so much beyond that. You have folks doing rehabilitative care and helping people after debilitating strokes or whatever it might be, to get back up on their feet, taking the steps needed to get them back into society and back doing the things they love. And as I walk, still as I go out and I do nursing home visits, and I, I just always pause at the therapy room because and I just bless it. Because I see these nurses' aides and I see these folks who are in there and they're working and they're getting their lives back on track. Back to being active and back to being a resource. It could be for their grandchildren and taking them, being able to go with them to ball games or whatever it is. And it brings me so much joy. I always pause and I just pray, Lord Jesus, these folks are so much a part of the healing care team. I bless them. Bless the work. I bless those rehab uh, I can't remember what they call them. It was kind of like bed things where people do leg lifts and they do the steps that you can practice taking one step after another. I, listen, I don't want to I don't, I don't just wax on this way too long but I, I, just, I just have to tell you um, it's so exciting to see those kinds of things happen. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen when these nurses' aides will 
who longed to put a belt around someone's waist so that they could help guide them and care for them. Some of you are, are medical type people. Are you medical type people? Just raise your hand for a minute. Uh, good, yeah, yeah, good medical people. Jesus, I just bless those medical people. The work you've called them to, I bless them in Jesus' name. But they can steer, they can kind of steer and guide them and help them and get them up and give them their balance while they're you know, while they're getting going, and it's a, a good thing for them. And as I was looking at this passage, I'm going to be focusing more on verses 15 through 19, those four verses there. <clears throat> because there is something really, really precious going on here. In this personal encounter that Jesus has with Peter. You know, how would you like to have breakfast with Jesus? You talk about the breakfast of champions, man. That's, that's it through and through, right? And so, I, find, I, I think it's beautiful that first Jesus is going to care for his existential needs. He's going to make sure his belly's full where he feels like he's been, a, he'd been defeated out fishing. You know, I don't know why. Peter, I, Peter really should have thought about a career change. How about you? What do you think? Mm -hmm. All the times that Jesus had to come along and go, you know, you may rethink this, okay? <laughs> but nonetheless, Jesus first cares for his existential needs. Got to feed his belly. Got to care for him. But then he is going to pull him aside. Can you see Jesus? Can you almost hear him? It's just think of that. I know how we're used to hearing this passage. See, Peter had his defeat and his failure, didn't he? Mm -hmm. I mean, the guy who is very, I mean, he's, he runs hot and cold. But then when he's presented with the test. He fails miserably in the garden. He fails miserably. When people come up and ask him, do you know Jesus? No, no, I don't know. <laughs> You'd hear that rooster echoing, that morning rooster echoing, uh, you're echoing out there, and it signifies Peter's defeat. So when Jesus kind of pulls Peter aside and says, come on up here, come on up here. Come on, let's have a little powwow, let's have a little chat. Now let's all just take a knee for a minute, okay? You know, Jesus could have said, fine friend, you are. <coughs> Boy, did you Peter up. I get promise no more. <laughs> Where were you? Oh yeah, big now. You said you're going to be there. Aren't you mighty now? Doesn't do that. Aren't you glad for that? Mm -hmm. It says to me, it says there's hope for me too. So it pulls them aside. And think of it in terms of rehab. It says, You've been through something catastrophic. It's a catastrophic failure. But let's get you back up again. Because Peter being down there, wallowing at whatever he is or wherever he happens to be, is going to do nothing for the kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. So he pulls him out. He pulls him away from the others, and he gives them one-on-one. -on -one. And rather than handing him some dumbbells, working some exercises, he's going he's gonna to work with him on something else that's a lot harder. You know, I, I love these folks. They get up, and they go to the gym, and then they snap pictures of themselves, going, oh boy, did I ever have a great workout? And everybody goes, you're up at 
oh, dark hundreds, and you're doing, you know, whatever. And you just want to look at him and go, <laughs> Maybe you do that. That's all right. You can go to the gym and you can work out, put your laps in, hit all your goals. But maybe inside, where's your spiritual fitness? Where's your spiritual fitness to be able to handle the temptations and things that come against you? And I believe that this is... Seeing this in a different way, seeing this as doing reps a different way, because Jesus is going to give him some, give him an exercise here. And so Jesus has this thing and goes back and forth with Peter three times, and he says, "Peter, do you love me?" Now we all know the Greek on this. That when Jesus talks about love, he's talking about agape love. He's talking about a self-surrendering, <clears throat> servanthood, sticky kind of love that says, I'm going to come to you first. And no matter what kind of grief or hassle you give me, I'm just going to keep reaching out to you in love. I'm going to take you where you are. But we're going to go somewhere together. It's a kind of love that seeks to bring healing to the life of another. Even when they're stomping on your foot. Think about maybe Vince had those moments and times he was ever working in the emergency room. Man, if you hadn't been cold cocked in the ER or been barfed on, puked on, or whatever. You know what? Right, Vince? <laughs> hey, these are the things that happen when you're rendering care to somebody. Hurt people do hurtful things. People in pain sometimes, they act out in their pain. Oh, no, Pastor, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but he, he, Jesus... As I said, Jesus is going to come at him with this agape love. And Peter, he's going to, when Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me like that? Peter is going to look at him and say, I love you like a brother. I love you like a social kind of love. I love you. That's where my love is. And maybe it's Peter's own realization of the true love that Jesus has and the love that he has. But do you see the difference between that social, brotherly, sisterly kind of love? It's a phileo love that Peter is coming to him with. He can't hit him with the agape kind of love. He is, you know how usually when we look at each other and we go, I love you, another person looks at his back and says, I love you too. He realizes his love falls short of the kind of love that Christ is coming at him with. And he's looking at the difference between the two. And Jesus recognizes the difference between the two. So the conversation is more like, just here for a minute. And this is an exercise in rehab. Because in order to get on the place of being restored, this is an exercise that he's going to go through. And that he's going to examine for himself. So let's hear it a different way. Peter, do you agape me? Yes, Lord, I phileo you. <laughs> kind of like, I'm not going to say phileo fish. <laughs> I don't know where this come from. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> and Jesus comes at him again. And he says, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter says, 
Yes, Lord, I phileo you. And then something miraculous happened. Because Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, do you phileo me? And Peter answers and says, Yes, Lord, I fillet of you. Do you friendship me, Peter? Do you brotherly love me, Peter? And Peter says, Yes, Lord, I brotherly love you. Why would that be? Why that response? It's one of the most amazing things, and I never saw it before. But I believe it was through the power of the Holy Spirit. I was able to see for the first time that kind of love that Jesus has. That says, okay, I would really love to have this kind of love from you, but I'm going to take you where you are. You can't come up to where I am. That isn't there yet. You are not there yet, but there is coming a time when you will be there yet. And so what's Jesus going to do? He's going to go to where he is, grab him by his belt, and they're going to walk up those steps that lead him to that place of a god love. He says, it's okay, I'll take you where you are, but I'm going to challenge you to a new place of agape love. I can't help but wonder about Peter. Why couldn't he say, I agape you back? Is it because of his embarrassment and his failure? Is it because he recognizes who he is and where he is? Is it his shame? Possibly. Is it Peter's regret? Is it Peter's remorse? We don't know, but whatever it is, it is absolutely debilitating. But Jesus will move him beyond it all. Perhaps Peter couldn't even imagine saying agape based on past performance, based on its past behavior. They are looking down at his sandals. Doesn't even know how he, in the face of the one who had laid down his life on a cross, who still stands there in love, Peter, do you agape me? Do you, do you love me like this? And Peter can't say it yet. I don't know about you, but there are times when I think I can really go the distance with my life. And then I get out of bed and I realize <laughs> Man, there's no way I can do this. I have to encounter that kind of love that brings the change to my life, that enables me, enables me to be transformed, as Paul said, into his likeness. Brothers and sisters in Christ, if I could have you write one thing down, please write this down. Please be kind to past versions of yourself that didn't know the things you know now. Because a defeated church that's still wandering around in shame and how they didn't measure up and they didn't live up to 
whatever, regret, remorse, whatever it is, is absolutely debilitating. Let me say that again. And I want you to hear this as if Jesus is saying it himself, because I believe this is Jesus' version of saying it to Peter. Peter, please be kind to yourself. Please be kind to past versions of yourself that didn't know the things you now know. I'll tell you what, I have things in my past. And I was raised in church. There are sometimes come back to haunt me. Am I the only one? No. Things I've said, things I've done, ways I've acted, the ways I've thought about other people. But if we get hung up in that, you see, we have to trust Jesus with not just the good Boy, good girl, times when we're rising to the moment and getting little pretty stars on our papers. But the times when we absolutely blew it, the devil loved to keep us focused on that stuff. Understand that Jesus loved you when you were screwing up too. Amen. Jesus loved you when you were screaming at your kids. Jesus loved you even when you were disciplining and the discipline went too far. But thank God the Holy Spirit reached into your heart and into your life and says, no, not, not that way, this way. Be thankful that God is able to get a hold of us and get us back on track. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Jesus is saying, I have you where you are now, but you're going to be different in the future. One day, Peter, you will embrace and be saturated in so much agape love. And where does that happen? How does that happen that you get saturated in that agape love? It happens on the day of Pentecost when the baptism of love floods down on Peter. How much of a change did it make? Peter got up. This one who couldn't even testify in the shadows gets up in broad daylight and he shares about Jesus Christ. And 5,000 people come to faith in Jesus that day. Somebody say amen. There's amen. hope for Peter. There's hope for us. Amen. But he couldn't do it when he was there in the going through rehab Jesus is getting him ready, going through rehab for the day of Pentecost because that's when that descending dove is going to come. That same power that filled Jesus, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead is going to come down and descend upon Peter. And cowards become courageous in those moments. Was it just for that day? No. You go read 1 Peter and 2 Peter on your own. Peter is going to write, this is many years later, Peter is going to write his epistles in the face of broad threats, storms, persecutions, temptations. And he's going to tell his listeners, his little flock, He's going to remind them of guess what kind of love. Oh, you got it, church. See, Peter's going to go. He, Peter's going to. It's going to be saturated, and it's not huge in his letters, but you can tell Peter's been through the rehab, y'all. He's been through the process. He's been filled with the Holy Spirit. And that made all the difference in his life. Something happened. 
that same baptism of love is available to you and to me in the filling of the Holy Spirit. We're going to hear more and more about it. We're going to walk in it more and more. I can't wait to see what God has in store for us. But can this be a place of rehab? Or we just take folks. Okay, you are where you are, but you know what? God's gonna, God's got plans. God's got big plans for you. God's got a, a power that's even bigger. That's gonna change the kind of love that we have and the way that we're able to love our community and love our families. Because if it doesn't hit the breakfast table. Amazing that Jesus started with breakfast. Mm. Speaking of which, did y'all get a good breakfast today? Mm -hmm. I can tell some of you had a lot of carbs. You're like, <laughs> I can't believe it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, we're going to have breakfast with Jesus now. Mm as he comes to us in the word and the sacrament, right here at this table. Are we all in? All in. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this baptism of love. Holy Spirit, just continue to saturate this congregation, saturate our lives, saturate our homes. Thank you that you come and you find us where we are and you put us through a rehab process that leads us to bigger, greater things. Be with us now as we join together at this holy table. In Jesus' mighty name, all God's people say. Amen. 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 Praise God. Jay? Yes. If you are able, please stand as we turn to page 85 in your green book and read together the profession of our Christian faith as found in the Apostles' Creed. Page 85. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was deceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May the holy peace that we cannot understand be with each and all of you. Now let's spread God's peace in this precious and holy place.